table here at Goodison Park. We're here tonight to honour. Hello, Amy. We're here tonight to honour all the uh, the captains that have played for Everton Football Club. You can see the list there. It's an incredible list: Dixie Dean, Jack Sharp, Brian LeBone, Alan Ball, Howard, Gary Speed, right up to Phil Jagielka, who's with us. Just a few uh, housekeeping notes: we are being filmed and we are being streamed live on EvertonFC.com. So I always give the same warning out every single time. If anyone uh, fancied a couple of days off and they've gone off on the sick, <laughs> you may well get noticed. If you're here with someone you shouldn't be, or your missus thinks you're playing darts, you may well get found out. Alive across the, literally across the globe. So without any further ado, please welcome our first guest, captain of Everton Football Club, Phil Jagielka. Anyway, no expense spared. Um, first and obvious question, what, what did it mean to you, Jags, when you were asked to be the captain of Everton Football Club? Um, it, was, it was quite strange, to be honest, because obviously with the way things went last season, with um, Nev not playing towards the end of the season and, and the manager sort of preparing me for, for his next season and being his captain, then obviously I uh, decided to go uh, 30 miles down the road. I was sort of left in a little bit of limbo with you know, not knowing what sort of uh, manager was going to come in next and what the plan was. So it was sort of uh, sit by the phone, wait wait for the sort of manager to be announced and and see if he still wanted me to do the job. So it was nice when he actually gave me the phone call and, and told me it was all official and stuff then. Um, it's been a pretty smooth transition since. I've obviously got a great bunch of lads in the change room and stuff. So as far as that goes, it's, it's a pretty easy job up to now. Had you been a captain before? I'd been a captain... Only on the pitch um, at Sheffield United, Chris Morgan was the captain of the club, but he didn't play for a few games, so I was sort of uh, wearing the armband and stuff. But I left all the the off the field duties to him and and sort of took all the the limelight with the captain's the captain's armband. Has it made that much of a difference to your role? Because even before you were the captain, you were one of the more uh, one of the more vocal members of the dressing room. Yeah, definitely. Um, like I say I'm I'm quite loud around the place as it was anyway, but. I think when you you are given the role, especially uh, as captain and stuff, you have to um, be loud in the right way, if that makes sense. You know, sometimes people will feel down, sometimes you will feel down, and you know, you're allowed to have a bad day, but probably not as not as often as as you are when you're not captain. So, <laughs> so I said out loud, it works. Isn't it? <laughs> um, so <laughs> testing me, aren't you now? Hey, <laughs> you have to deal with stupid microphones and stuff as well, but. Um, no, it's just all about sort of growing up and growing into it. You know, I've I've known most of the lads around the changing room for a long time. One, two. I, know, I know what buttons to press and when to press them, and um, I think I've done an okay job, which is more than we can say for the sound engineers. Um, we uh, every single person in this room would love to run out of the head of an Everton team onto a packed Goodison Park when they start playing Z cars. Is it is it possible to to describe what that's like, or are you actually? In the zone. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> I'm not laughing at the actual question. Uh, it's still not going to work. Do you want to use your mic? <laughs> it must be. Hey, it's a scout. There we go. Yeah, hopefully it'll keep working. No, um, you are obviously in the zone, ready for the game, but you still get the goose pimples. Uh, I love the fact how. You know, traditional our um, sort of entrance to the pitches. You know, obviously we come down the stairs. I'll make sure, first and foremost, you don't slip. One, two, one, two, one, two. I'll tell you what, we'll just take a little break for a couple of minutes just while the lads try and uh, press some buttons and work some faders. Just uh, talk amongst yourselves for a couple of minutes. So think of a question that you want to ask Jags a little bit later on. We'll cut the live streaming off as well, I hope.
Phil Jagielka. <laughs> Cheers, mate. So he's gone. Of work.
To introduce to you this evening, ladies and gentlemen, our first was the captain of Everton in the early 80s. Please welcome Mark Higgins. been assured that it's been mended. I've just been told that the mics were off. Is that right? <laughs> um, let's go back to the very beginning then, Mark. When did you first become associated uh, as a young footballer with, uh, with Everton Football Club? I first came here in 1972-73 because I was lucky enough to play for the England schoolboys. I played when I was like sort of 14 and then I was like captain when I was like sort of 15 years of age. Uh, so I was lucky to play at Wembley four times by the time I was like 15 years of age. And I had the choice of, like any club, uh, I went to City, I went to United, I went to Tottenham, I went to Arsenal. I didn't go to Liverpool. Um, and then I came to Everton as well, but this is the club which I really loved. Plus at that time, you think of the great side, you know, when there's sort of Labby, Candelavi ball. And plus then, they were known as like the millionaire club with obviously the Moors falling behind. And I mean, at Belfield was a super training ground. So I, j I just thought when I came, I thought that this is the club I want to go to. Because, of course, football's in the family, isn't it? Your dad was a professional footballer. That's right. My father played for Bolton back in the 50s and uh, won the cup final in 1958 uh, when they beat sort of Man United. And bless his heart because my dad's passed away and so has Dave Ixon, which was in the lounges. And Dave told me that going back, back in the 50s, he used to kick the lumps out of each other. <laughs> a different game now. Absolutely. You could get away with it in those days, couldn't you? So who, who were your contemporaries? Who else was in the youth team uh, in the early 70s when you were there, Mark? In the youth team, when I signed here, was a guy called, like, sort of Ray Deakin, who has, like, sadly passed away. Deeks was, with the, like, with me, you know, like, back in the schoolboys' sign. Uh, and then they had a, a lad called, like, Martin Mo at the side, who was going to be the next George Best, which lots of people my age will probably remember that. Uh, you know, we did have a good side. But then when I signed, you, you know, there was lots of centre hours. When I think, because the first one I played with was, like, sort of Roger Kenyon. Uh, there was obviously John Hurst. Uh, then there was Mickey Lyons. There was like sort of Ken McNaught, there was Dave Jones who, who, who like play centre half, and then there was Billy Wright who played with me, and obviously Rats who's on next. It, w it was great in those days when you, as a kid, I used to come to Goodison and watch reserve team football. The reserve team players, young players like yourself, could play at Goodison Park every two weeks, couldn't you? That was great because we did. I mean, I was lucky to play there, as you say, because I was playing like in reserves, and we had a run where we played in in like the FA Youth Cup. Uh, and this is how the game's changed now. I mean, I played on the Friday down at Palace in the final, and I was rushed back on the train the next morning, so I'd get back at 3 o'clock to play in the afternoon's reserves. Who took the reserves then, Mark? Uh, well, what happened with me, there was a coach uh, which took me when I was down with the kids, like sort of Harrison, which was like sort of Eric Harrison. And Eric was a nice guy, but he was a hard guy to, you know, sort of work under. And when I moved up the reserves, I was really pleased. But then Eric moved up with me. <coughs> so he then moved up with me. So I had to have him again. And then fortunately, when I got into the first team, I thought, well, I'm away from him because I was... And then Eric moved up to the first team. When did you make your debut? I made my debut against City. I played left back uh, against, like, Dennis Stewart. And he went and broke my nose. I'm on like my debut. He broke your nose? <laughs> <laughs> I've only broken about six, seven times. <laughs> Welcome to the first division. What, Correct. What, 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 was it, what was it like to play for Everton for the first time? It was a dream because it was just after my 18th birthday. Uh, obviously being a centre half, but obviously the gaffer then Gordon Lee said he wanted me to play left back, and I was happy just to play. So to obviously to, you know sort of make my debut was a great experience for me. Were you at left back for long? No, I wasn't. Uh, I then played just a couple of games that season, and then the next season, 77, 78, when I, I first went in the side. This is when I think it was Nottingham Forest like came up for the first time, uh, and we played Forest at home. Uh, there was like Peter with, and like I think it was Tony Woodcock, and we got beat at home three-one. Second game we went away, we played against the Arsenal, and we got beat there two-one. I thought this is going to be fun and games. Uh, and then the third game we went to Villa, and I'm playing against like obviously Andy Gray, and we beat Villa. And then we went on a run for 23 games and didn't lose a game. 
I often think the 1970s are a bit harsh on Everton when it when when it's reviewed as a as a historical period for the football club because we had some smashing sides. We came close on occasions, third in the league, fourth in the league, semi-finals of the FA Cup, final of the League Cup. But I think we're judged harshly because Liverpool was so successful. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would do because obviously they were a great side, and obviously I like played against that side. You, you know, with like you saw the Sooness and you, you know you saw Dalglish and Hanson and Lawrence and all that lot. But I mean, we had a good side because the first side I went into, when you think I play with, obviously Roger Kenyon first of all, and then there was Mickey Lyons. It was a Lyons. It was a true blue, so you know, sort of really blue. Uh, Mick Pedgick, There was Duncan. There was Latchy. There was like Dave Thomas, Andy King. We had a, we, we, you know, we did have a really good side, and we, ca you know, as you say we finished third in the league, and obviously in the cup, and then '77 when we lost in the League Cup final to uh, like Villa that time. So yeah, we did have a good side. You mentioned the Lions in and, and Roger Kenyon. I mean, they were they were proper centre halves, weren't they? Yeah, because back in those days, you could actually tackle. I mean, if I played now, I'd, I'd probably play about five or six games a season. You know, because because you just can't do it. Uh, the game has changed that much. But I learned a lot from Roger and also from Mick, and two sort of great centre halves to play with. And then, obviously, sort of Billy Wright came on the scene, and a play with Billy, uh, who again was a really good player, had a bit of a problem with his weight, and that. I think I think we all know the story where Howard told him when we got weighed to do something about it, and next week when he got weighed, he had it. It like put weight on. <laughs> so I don't think I think that's the reason that I ended up playing with rats. He was a good footballer, Billy, though, wasn't he? Billy was a good player. He was a scouser. He was a, a super guy, and people didn't realise, but he was a better player than what a lot of people gave him, you know like sort of gave him the credit for. Uh, but then what happened with Billy? And obviously Kevin. Then when I played with Kevin, because Howard took a chance because he would never play two sort of left-sided players at centre-half. It was the first time he'd, he'd, he'd ever thought about doing it. But he obviously asked me to play in the right because I had a better right foot than Kevin. I think I've got a better right foot than Kevin, actually. <laughs> we'll bring that up when he comes in. You were in the team when Howard was the manager and Gary Stevens came through, Kev Richardson came through, Sharpie was made a name for himself. Did you, did you realise what a good squad of players we had and that we were on the cusp of something? Yes, I did, because obviously being captain of the side then, and I could see the players, because obviously the side I said back in the sort of late 70s was a good side, and then we went through this sort of transitional period. And then when I was made captain, I could see this team, you know, which was being put together. And I was captain. It was just so bad luck for me, really, because I could see, as, you know, this, this team would go on to win things. And I was playing at a time which, you know, they, you know they, I had more jabs, which obviously now they wouldn't do. I know players still get injected, but... I had probably 16 to 18 in my groins within the space of like two, you know, probably two, two to three months. And that's just the way the game was then. And I obviously wanted to play for the club. Uh, Howard said that he needed me to play because, I, you, know, you know, like I was his captain, so I played. You and I have had this conversation many times before, Mark, but what, how, how tough were those days? How tough was it being at Wembley for the 1984 FA Cup final, for example? It must, you must have had such mixed feelings. Well, obviously, my last game here was where we played against West Ham th in the quarter-final of the Milk Cup. And obviously, that season, we went on to obviously lose Liverpool in the Milk Cup final. I'm out injured thinking then, and then we went on to win the Cup in 84, which I've just been talking to Rats upstairs before I came in. And, you know, sort of bless him, he has said now that he wished that he had actually taken me up to go and collect the Cup because I, you know, because I was the club captain. Uh, which is obviously nice of him to say, but obviously, when you're young and you just, you know, want to be there for yourself. So, but it was nice of him to say, but... When I think back, it, I mean, it, it hurts now because I saw, like in the programme, they're talking about doing 30 years on in May since, since they won the Cup in 84. And it still hurts when I think about it because obviously that year, 84, we, well, 83, I can remember, first of all, we lost to Man United away 1-0. I think it was like sort of Lou Macari scored. And we battered United then. And I, I think we you know, sort of should have got to win with them. Didn't do it. 84, as I say, we had the Milk Cup final. Uh, then obviously we went and won the FA Cup. So I'm then trying to get myself fit, but obviously playing the Shield, which I didn't. And then the next season went on to another cup final, which you know we lost obviously, like to Man United. But then we won the league, uh, and also we won the Cup and the Cup. So I'm going through all that, still trying to get myself fit. I'd had like three operations on my groin, and uh, and then I'm told I'm finished at, at like 25. It, it's an unthinkable scenario. Did it help in any way, shape, or form that that Inchi was with you for? Much of the 84, 85 season? I have seen a photograph recently, which was which, which in the programme that time, uh, of like me, like sort of me and Inchi sat there. It doesn't, it doesn't, because I feel sorry for Inchi because he's going to miss out as well. But uh, at the time, you, you just can't, 
I just can't explain even now the way it just makes you feel. Because obviously, I've been at the club for 10, 11 years. I'd gone through like a good time with them. We had this transitional period and then to go back on again to a team which I knew was going to win things. And obviously, when I had to retire, Kevin Blessing took on the mantle and ended up doing a great job. Ladies and gentlemen, any questions from the floor for Mark Higgins? Don't want to look Thank at me, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mark, um, you played the ambassador role for Everton now and then. How does it feel that you're still involved with the club? I mean, you've had your ups and downs, and, and it, it, I think everybody here feels for you. But you've got to be a special person to be kept on all this time, and you've got to project yourself in the right way in the image of the club. How does it feel? Well, it feels great because for a time when I did finish, I, I did actually keep away from the club, not because of you, the supporters, which were absolutely superb, not for the club, you know, but it was just me and myself because I was hurting. And it was so nice because I came to an ex-player's dinner, uh, which is, this is the best club in the world for doing it because they, you know, th because they do look after the ex-players. And I came to this dinner, I thought, because one day that could be me that like needs that help. So I came to that, and then I was asked, why don't you, you know, just go back to a game? And then my family, my wife, and my kids said to me, look, Dad, you are far better going back. And I came one time, and then I did, because the fans were absolutely great with me, with like being away for years, not being away through like sort of want to be, but just through the sheer pain, you know, which I, which I went through when I left. It was uh, honestly hurt me so bad. But then when I came back, and then the last two seasons since I've been doing this, I absolutely love it, and you people have been absolutely marvellous with me. Well, we, we look forward to seeing you anyway. Thank, Thank you very much indeed. Any other questions for Mark? Yep. Yeah, Bill Kenwright was at school with me. If I'd have known he was going to buy Everton Football Club, I'd have given my dinner money every day. <laughs> how much, how, how, how often or how much do the players actually get involved with the chairman? Well, I don't know that now. I mean, I mean, like, you know, sort of not being a player now, but I do see Bill on, like, sort of each match day when I'm here, and he's a super guy. He does love the club. He has never told me, you know, sort of through and through. I know it's different because of the money when you think about your Manchester Cities and obviously United and all the different clubs about the moment, but I think Bill, if he ever did let go, he wants to make sure that it, it is somebody that really wants to, you know, sort of move the, you know, sort of move the club forward. When you think of Cardiff... You know, they've got to change the colour of shirts. I mean, could you ever imagine someone coming here and, cha and changing our shirts to red? It just wouldn't happen. You certainly wouldn't sell many, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, what was the relationship like when you were a player with, uh, with yourselves and the, and the chairman and the board of directors? Because they used to go on pre-season tour with you, didn't they? That was a whole different time when I was playing because they did come away with us. And it, it is a different thing because back in the 70s and sort of, you know, like the 80s when I played, we did have a beer. And I used to say to the lads, even the, with the wives, the girlfriends, or like whatever, I said that when we play a derby game or any game like that at home, we are going out into town, into the pubs, and drinking with the people. Because it, it is like sort of you people which actually pay our wages. And I think the game has changed so much that the players, I'm not knocking them now because it's their fault that they're paid so much money, but it just seems to be on a, like a different level now. With my day, we, we did go into the pubs, go into town, have a bevy with everybody, and that's the way it used to be. You were the captain then. Who, who were the lads you had to keep a particular close eye on when you went out and about in the city centre? First of all, myself. Uh, <laughs> no, I was always there with the lads because, I mean, I must admit that, you know, like I did like a pint myself. But I think most lads, we did have a good side, you know, it was obviously Reedy, Andy Gray, Sharpie, Rats. I mean, we, you know, there was one or two quieter ones at the side, which was obviously Sheeds, um, sort, of, sort of Trevor Steed. We were a bit more quiet, but we had a few that would go out and have a good time. Do you, do you have any sympathy with the lads of these days who can't, they can't move, can they, without uh, mobile phones and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and what have you? It obviously makes life hard for them, but I mean, they pay some serious money, to, and, that, and that's just part, part of the game now. Uh, I think I played through the better times. I mean, I had a chance, well, I had three, there were three clubs that came in to buy me from Everton, and uh, I said no. I was offered more money, but I said no, because I was happy. I was captain of the side, a great club. Uh, I've been a blue all my life, and you know I would never have left. When you look back on your career, Mark, you played for for two fantastic clubs, Everton and Manchester United. How did how did the Manchester United move come about? Well, that happened because and I'm actually pleased you've asked me that because there was somebody in the lounge said to me, "What happened about the insurance money and also going to Manchester United?" So, thanks for asking the question. And basically, what happened when I was told I was finished, uh, I'd had like three operations on my groin area, 
and nothing had worked. And I was told I was finished. So, uh, so I went back to Buxton where I lived at the time and I just didn't know what to do. And it was only through um, uh, like Gordon Strachan and he rang me and said about this guy in London. So I went to see this guy in London and he did this last operation when I was finished. Because Everton had gone and drawn their money on me. I had gone and been paid out my insurance. Uh, so then I was finished. And so anyway, I decided myself to go and have this operation. And within about six to eight weeks, I felt like I could, I could sort of run again, sort of free of pain. And I was only, I'd been out finished then probably 15 months. And I came back to see Howard. And I said, look, Howard, I think I can probably play again. I've got a chance. And he turned around to me and said, well, we've got and drawn the money. And he'd had a good side. Obviously, Derek Mountfield came in and he was thinking about taking a chance on me, you know, being injured again. <coughs> so he said to me about me going to Holland. Uh, I, I said, no. I said, I feel, because I played for him when I was, he said to me, because I like need you, because, you know, because you're my captain. And I kept playing, jab after jab after jab. So I was a bit heartbroken, and, and I went down the stairs at, at like Belfield, thinking, what do I do? And I got the number for the Cliff at United. I rang up Big Ron Atkinson. And I went over to Ron. I like told the story. He said to me, train with me for three to four months, which I did with your white side, your Robson, your Strachan and all that. And lucky for me, within side four months, he signed me. So I paid back the money which I'd had. Obviously, Man United paid back the money which the club had had. And that's when I came back to playing. But let me just say, if I'd have had the chance, there's no way I would have gone ever to Manchester United. But Howard never gave me the chance to come back and try. Did you enjoy it at Manchester United? It was nice to be back in the game. It's, it's obviously a big club, but my heart's always been here. Uh, and Everton was a much... It, it, it is a different club. There's a much more of a family feel it was. Obviously, United, I still go now to games, and it, it is more of just a corporate machine. It's just a money-making machine, and whereas this is a much more happy family club. It, it was nice to be back in the game. And as you say, to be finished being captain of Everton, then to come back, obviously, to play for Manchester United, it was, you know, the, you know, there's not many people do that. As the gentleman said there before, everybody loves seeing you on a match day in the lounges, and it must make the job of a lounge host a little bit easier when the team is playing such good football and, and getting such great results at Goodison Park. It certainly helps, because obviously this is like a fortress. I mean, when you see teams come here, I mean, we've, we've just had sort of far too many draws. As, you know, when I think back to last season, the only real bad time was the, not this season, but last season, the game against Wigan. Uh, I just, I just like, couldn't believe what I'd seen. It was like bang, bang, bang. It was one, two, three, and it was, it, it, it was just all over. To come back in the lounge then and try and talk to people is very, very hard. But then I said to people the next game, I thought, well, I have to try and sort of do this myself. I said, we could be playing City at home. And I'd, I just warned them, if we play like we did against Wigan, we're going to be beat four, five, or six. I thought I'd just get this in quick. And when you think, we went down to 10 men and we go and beat City. So it's a crazy game, football. Never get used to it, do we? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to stay where you are, we've got a club photographer here. And he's, Mark is going to come round each table and get a group photograph taken. So we'll start at this end. So if you want a, a comfort break, I think we can call it because we are live on EvanFC.com. Mark will work his way around and our photographer at the back will take some group pictures. But for now, an absolute gentleman and a fantastic Evertonian, Mark Higgins. Thank you.
Legend. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce you to our, our third and final guest. Please welcome into the room, quite simply, our most successful ever captain, Kevin Ratcliffe. Not sure if it's colour or black and white, but here we go. Say you don't know me. I recognize my face. Say you don't care who goes to that kind Full colour. There you go. Um, we'll have to start with that goal at Anfield. <laughs> what were you doing there in the first place? A bit embarrassed with the, uh, the uh, celebration, really, but it, it, it was the red shite, so... Uh, <laughs> we're all live on EvertonFC.com <laughs> tonight, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, the last thing I said to Kevin Rockley was, don't forget, we're live <laughs> around the world. Uh, well, just in case some of them are listening. <laughs> We all we go when I was in Norway as well, so oh, yeah, I got every chance then. <laughs> so what are you doing in there? What are you doing in there half anyway? Uh, well, I, I thought it, you know, it was a, thought if I could sort of hit it, make it bounce six times, and on the last one swerve a little bit, um, <laughs> um, and then I realised it was going just past the post, and I thought Bruce did ever so well to bring it back in and. Uh, <laughs> throw it in the back of the net and I was a little bit surprised but when I read about two years later they got done for fixing results <laughs> and had 2-0 on our woes and Kevin Ratcliffe to score the goal <laughs> at 100 to 1. Um, and the rest. Uh, yeah, he now lives in a massive house somewhere um, but uh, no, I just, uh, I was, uh, I mean, I didn't get many opportunities and when I did I thought well I'll chance me luck and lucky enough on the day that went in didn't it, it wasn't, uh, like I say it wasn't the best of goals but uh, you know, 492 games and only two goals. I mean, uh, you know, it's not a great record to have. And then I go down and play for Cardiff. And on my debut, I score for Cab Cardiff. So, uh, you know, the gaffer at Howard wasn't doing something right if he wasn't putting me up for corners. <laughs> there aren't many players that played nearly 500 games for Everton. And on a night like this, we've still got plenty of time for, for you to talk us through every goal you scored. You might as well tell us, you might as well tell us about the Norwich one, don't you? <laughs> Was it against Norwich? <laughs> In the 32nd minute, in three seconds, um, <laughs> right foot broke away from a corner. Um, can't remember it. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a, they had a corner, Norwich, and uh, it broke. And, you know, obviously with my pace, I was first to go past Sharpie and then uh, the rest of the lads. And uh, I think the ball come across and first touch. And people might say I tried to control it and it shot into the back, top corner, but I, I didn't. I meant a shot. I, 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 Took it first time with my right foot, went straight into the corner. I've asked Chrissy Woods as well, who played for Norwich at the time. He wasn't a bad keeper. Only scored against great keepers. <laughs> Never in training every day. Um, so, you know, Bruce and then uh, Chris Woods. So, uh, I can't remember the fella in, in goal for Carlisle, by the way, uh, when I played for Cardiff. In, in all seriousness, was, was it a case that when we did have a corner, Derek Manfield was so effective that if you did try to go forward, he'd just say, no, 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 leave it with me? Uh, I think I was a bit of a hindrance, I think going up and uh, I, I think Howard really sort of seen it as that you know he used my pace that if they did counter attack then I had the pace to deal with it and I think that was the main reason if we were sort of losing games or you know there were set pieces when we were losing then maybe I'd go up but very very not for seldom anyway because maybe we were losing games. Some fantastic footage there which we never get tired of looking at does it seem 30 years ago Kev? Um, it did this morning when I woke up, but uh, no, not when you're seeing it, you know, you, your brain still ticks over, but, you know, I don't kick a ball now, I couldn't do anything like that, it's, uh, I did it a few years ago and it took me about three months to recover, um, you, you, you know, you think you can do it, you see the pass, but as soon as your foot comes back and you, you make contact with the ball, you realise that you, you haven't got that anymore, 
you know you haven't got the the strength in your legs to hit 30 yard never well, 10 yard balls never mind 30 yard balls so your charity game career is well and truly over it's well and truly if you see me just shoot me <laughs> if i get on you know somebody asked me to go and play there's not even a five aside no i didn't even go and play um uh, you know when i played I, I i didn't really play football in the yeah, you, you know, in your garden with the kids. When I had young kids, I, 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 you know, it's like a joiner going home and trying to work, isn't it? You, you want to try and forget it a little bit. You still wouldn't have scored anyway, would you? Well, if I put one of the kids, it might have <laughs> half a chance. <laughs> Just a word about Higgy there, Mark Higgins, a good friend of yours. It was a shame what happened to him, but he was a, he was a class act, wasn't he? Well, gee, I, wa I walked into the football club at, uh, in 77, uh, and Higgy was, I think, the first year pro then. He was about two or three years older than me. And he's one of these lads that you knew, and everybody knew him in them days. He was one of the great schoolboys, um, you know, that, that was about in them days. You know, if you see the schoolboys these days, like, you know, the, the, like the Wayne Rooney's, you know, when Wayne Rooney was playing schoolboys for England. That's what Iggy was doing. Iggy was playing for England. He was captain of England. Uh, and everybody knew Mark Higgins, like you say, and uh, I signed for Everton Football Club, and I thought, oh, I've got to try and get, you know, up to his standard, really, and he was sort of just on the verge of maybe getting into the first team. And um, he, well, he's, you know, he's he's a big man. You know, he's a he's, you know a, he was a big lad, 18, 19 years of old. He was, you know, really, really big. And you're thinking, well, I've got a long, long way to go. And fortunately, you know, I became good friends with him, played alongside him. And uh, I honestly believe that if Iggy had kept away from his injury, that. Uh, we still have gone on, gone on and done what we've done, you know, with with him. Maybe wouldn't have had to buy Dave Watson, um, and maybe Derek wouldn't have had his chance. Think he was that good. I thought he was. He was actually had a little bit of everything. Um, he, he was hard as nails. He'd get you to go. Um, decent left foot, good pace. Out of the three, la the two lads that I've mentioned, Iggy and uh, uh, sorry, uh, Derek and um, and Waggy, he was most probably the quickest out the out the two of them. Um, so he, he he had everything, you know. He, he could have been a top top player. He was just saying that if he played now, he'd probably only play about five or six games a season through suspensions. You, you didn't get that many sentences off, did you? Um, well obviously you you're leading me into one. Uh, um, yeah, I got. I, I think you learn your lesson. I got sent off a couple of times. Once in pre-season, um, where I tackled the lad uh, waist high because he'd made a few nasty challenges. I think it was Warsaw away. Uh, and little did I know that, you know, playing in pre-season games that they get carried on into league games. So I missed the first game of the season against Stoke. Uh, ironically, I was ill on the day anyway, so it was a good job I was suspended. Um, but before that, I was against Manchester City here in the quarterfinals where I headbutted um what was his name now? The Scottish, it's Tom Hutchinson, yeah, which uh, got me the nickname of Lurpak for a couple of years. The best butter in the land, but... Uh, <laughs> I wasn't too pleased. Him? I wasn't too pleased with that, uh, with that uh, sort of thing. It's one of them denials, you know. You denial, you deny that you touched him. You touched him, then it come on match of the day, and I, oh Christ, did I touch him? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you you start to believe that you didn't touch him until you've actually seen it. So uh, yeah, it was a, it was a lesson, you know, learned and most probably cost us a semi final place. Um, I think Manchester City actually Tommy Hutchinson scored two goals in the final, didn't he? That. So it, I think it cost us a, a, a definitely a, a final play, well, semi-final, but final place. Had he been having a dig throughout the game? And it's not yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, I was only, I think, I was only nineteen, twenty, and he, he was uh, an experienced international, and uh, it's you know crafty, old so and so, and uh, but I could become good friends with Tommy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah later on, because he he played for Swansea and lived in that area for years. So uh, with us going down there with Wales quite a few times, then. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was good to catch up with him again. I'll <laughs> ask you the same question that um, I asked Higgy before. You were at Everton before it really took off in 83-84. Uh, when did you think to yourself, we've got something here, we've got a chance? Um, I don't know, I think maybe the season after we won the, the FA Cup. You know, we'd, we'd gone on a great run. Um, from just before Christmas, where we were mostly in the bottom six, and then we ended up in the top six at the end of the year, we were getting into a, a League Cup final and the FA Cup final. And I don't think it was until the next year. Um, and you, you then start believing that maybe you've got a chance of winning the league. You know, we were competing with the best, and 
we were we we could mix it. That was that was the good thing about the side is the lads had gelled really really well together. Um, we'd had a good pre-season together, uh, been away on tour together a couple of times, um, and it it just seemed like I say very very quickly got together. You know you wouldn't say that it happens. Um, sort of over a period of years, but it suddenly, all of a sudden, just went bang, all together, and that was it. And it was, uh, you know, as you see the record books here, there was no stopping us. But we had a good mixture of lads who, you know, if you wanted to go out there and fight us, we'd fight, and then we could play as well. And we were brought up like that, that you had to mix it. You were playing in teams like Wimbledon, you know, you'd be playing against the likes of Graham Souness, you know, who's most probably one of the dirtiest players I've ever ever seen and played against and uh, but one of, one of the greatest players that I've played against and seen as well you know technically football wise he was a great footballer but he was a dirty so and so um, so you had to be I thought I had that, had to be, had that little bit of a nasty edge to actually go on and win things um, and when you've got the likes of myself Reedy, Sharpie, Andy Gray, Neville you know who, who were you know we, we could look after ourselves and uh, you know you, that's what you needed to do you need to have a little bit of everything you could give it and take it in those days, but there were some rough and tough centre forwards, weren't there? Your Mick Harford, your Billy Whitehurst, and one of you. Who was the, who was, who was the worst one to play against, Kevin? Well, Billy uh, Billy Whitehurst was, was definitely up there. There's no doubt about it. I mean, um, he, he put a nasty tattle in on Brace, and I remember me and Reedy going in for a tattle with him and hurt ourselves. Um, he got in from the front, I got in from behind. and uh, But he, he was the only player that I'd actually seen Nev want to fight. And I thought, Phew. I don't want to be anywhere near this. I want a ringside seat, but I don't want to be anywhere near it. Um, because he went in for two challenges with... Uh, well, he didn't. The one player for Oxford went in, in for two challenges with Nev. Um, and I seen the sort of, uh, you know, the, the red light, if you see, after the game and went straight for this lad. And Billy Whiter has come up and uh, me and Billy were sort of, should we say, just talking. <laughs> he was telling me and I was listening. <laughs> And the next minute, this lad come flying past me, and it was the lad who'd actually gone and tattled Nev. And Nev had actually rabbit punched him in the back of the neck, uh, the neck, and he was he come past me. He was like a break dancer, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it was uh, him and Billy. Then went for it, type of thing, and uh, it sort of nearly carried on into the players' lounge. And I thought, oh, this is going to be this. This was heavyweight division, by the way. Um, Mickey Hartford. He w he was. He was one not to mess around with. He, he was he was nuts, but technically a good player as well. No pace, but technically a good player. He's a, he's a, on similar lines. A sharpie, good in the air, get all the stuff. Um, but on the floor, sharpie was a lot better than that. But uh, yeah, th them two, uh, Peter with, you know, going to there. There was a proper centre forwards, aren't they? The proper centre forwards, but the chain the game's changed now, you know. And uh, I always believe like good players will will change to adapt the game to. You know, if you, I think the one thing is that I, I think now that defenders are scared to defend, as in tackling, because, you know, even when they get it right, it's a penalty. So, we, you know, and then you're off. So I actually think they're actually scared of making a challenge. Um, and people call them the bad defenders, but they're actually staying on the pitch. Bad defending is when you go off the pitch. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's just the way the game is. I don't think it's good for the game. You know, it's not good because the referee is, is put, being put under pressure every week. You know, and it's, uh, they're being scrutinised on the TV from every ankle. Um, you know, and they're saying, like, they want uh, you know, they want replays and, you know, and everything to make the decision easier for the referees. But if that happens, what do we go and talk about? You know, what do we talk about or wait to the next game? You know, was it a penalty? Wasn't it a penalty? Um, you know, that's, a, that's the greatest thing about football is... You know, it's a, it's a great talking material all week, isn't it, till the next game? I think one of the one of the best brawls here that was also a decent game of football was Bayern Munich, wasn't it? In uh, in 1985, we had an interesting afternoon when we were making a DVD a few years ago. There was myself and Kevin and Sharpie, Andy Gray, and uh, and Reedy watched uh, some highlights from the 84-85 season. That would have ended five aside at best, wouldn't it, that night? Yeah, I don't think. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't have been on the pitch. I know that, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I'd already been booked over in uh, in Munich, so I would have missed the final as well. But it was a, it was a great night, and it's one that you'll never forget. 
See, people always remember Sharpie and, and Andy Gray batting him into submission, but you were like a silent assassin that night, weren't you? You got away with it. Yeah, I mean, uh, we did mark the winger. I can't remember his name. And, uh, you know, in them days, you took people out. That was your job. It was the rules of the game. So you, you abided near enough to the rules. So uh, the idea was that one of us had to take him out. And it was whoever first could get to him. And uh, unfortunately for him, it was me. And uh, it, it slowed him down maybe a game or two. But, uh, you know, you could get away with it in them days. You know, every game you went into, you earmarked certain people that you were out to, to sort of, well, do what you could. Because you could get away with it. I mean, they, they're exactly the same for us. I remember, you know, we played against Southampton once here. And uh, straight from the kickoff, well, somebody's gone and smashed Reedy straight in the face, nowhere near the ball. And Reedy's out. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? We've only just kicked off. Ball comes into the, the Gladys Street goal mouth. And the lad Holmes, who's made a run from midfield, runs straight across me. So I smashed him. And he's gone flat out on the floor. So we've got Reedy on the halfway line out for the count. And we've got him out for the count. And the, uh, the referee at the, on that day was Keith Hackett. So he hasn't seen it, but the linesman in the far corner has. And he's waving his flag. And he's in the other side of the pitch. And I, I'm thinking, oh, no, if he's seen this, I'm off. There's no danger. Because I've caught him with, with a full fist, really. And uh, <laughs> Those were the days. Day, it was a, a full fist. I never had my knuckle duster on me that day, so he's a bit. Low. And the um, next minute, Keith Hackett pulled us, up, pulled us over, pulled their skipper over, and uh, Holmes, and I think it was, I'm not too sure who did Reedy. And they pulled us over. He said, Look, lads, he says, that's one each. Let's get on with a good game now, shall we? <laughs> and that's, so, the way, that's the way it should be. Well, that was a bit lucky, yeah. Yeah, but, um, you know, that, 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 they, were, they were the rules. You, you play to the rules, don't you, in certain ways. People tend to forget how young, for want of a better phrase, Andy Gray and Peter Reid were, but they, was, they were still in their late 20s, weren't they, when they... Uh, I think they were 28. <laughs> yeah, they were, 28 and 29, and people think they were in their mid to late 30s because they were so experienced, but I think they were just streetwise, weren't they? Um, well, they were experienced maybe in playing games. Um, Andy, obviously, had been down as a 20-year-old from Dundee to sign... <laughs> Uh, was it for Villa? Was it for Villa? For whatever it was, million pound or whatever. And he come to us for about 250 grand, 28 years of age, supposedly finished, and played 55 games with us and, and really sort of kicked us on, really. And uh, we learnt a lot from him on the field and off the field. Um, and if he was finished, then at 20, he must have been a hell of a player. Because I tell you what, his touch, his passing... It's bravery. Um, the only player I know that's actually scored a half volley header at Notts County. Um, and I, I think the bravest player I've ever played, played with was Dave Watson. And possibly Mark as well. And there's a little bit of difference between bravery and stupidity. And I think Andy goes in between them two. Um, because some of the balls he used to go for, I'm telling you, I couldn't believe that he was going for that ball because there was no chance he was going to win it. But if he didn't win it, neither did that centre-half. And I remember we played against Southampton and I remember that Kev Sheedy took a corner and Kevin Bond was playing for Southampton and he rose and he headed the ball. But as he headed the ball, Andy Gray head-butted him in the back of the head and the ball hit the top of the crossbar and went out for a, for a corner. And I said to Andy, have you just... And he went, yeah. I said, why did you do that? He said, well, I knew I couldn't get the ball, but I thought if I could play a cannon off his head. <laughs> He was, he was, uh, and, and you know what Andy's like, he couldn't whisper over three fields, could he? So he, uh, you know, wherever we went, we got in, and you know, at night, and he was, he was good company. He was a, he's a man's man, but really, you know, it was a togetherness, and he gelled well with Reedy, Sharpie, Adrian Heath, and uh, yeah, good, good times. The social side was very good, wasn't it, in the mid-80s? And don't forget, we're still alive. Oh, are we? <laughs> Hello, love. <laughs> um... Yeah, I mean, look, you, you can't win things by going out at the wrong times and enjoying yourself. Um, you know, we, we knew when we could celebrate and when not to celebrate. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it was great. You know, it was, uh, you know, everybody says it's a drinking culture. I still think now you can drink and play. You know, people say they're fitter now than they've ever been. 
and, and fitter than when we played. But the pitches are great. The, you know, the balls are lighter and they still get cramp. And they've got a fitness coach and they've got energy drinks. Um, try drinking a bottle of lager. It's, well, yeah, you don't get cramped with that. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're actually training on better pitches than we played on. So I think it's all a bit of a mind game that, uh, you know, they're actually fitter. You know, you couldn't play football if you weren't fit. You couldn't win things if you weren't fit. When you think the likes of yourself and Neville played almost 60 games in 84, 85, and some, a lot of players don't play that over two seasons now. Some four. <laughs> um, I think I played 60, I think I think 64 or 65 games one year. And, and that's, I, with, that's without internationals as well. Yeah, I think if I would have played in the last game of the season against Luton, I would have most probably got the uh, most that an outfield player had played at that time. Um, the one that had actually played that that got 66 uh, was Bruce Grobler. So um, yeah, it was. He just wanted to. I had to have the bonus, yeah, yeah and the appearance money. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that that was the big thing. You know, you're on appearance, you're on boat. Um, good sort of bonuses. Went you, on, went you on crowd bonuses at one time? Yeah, you? that was against, um, where was it? That was only when we got into Europe. Um, they were a bit crafty, the club, because obviously they'd looked at sort of figures. And uh, I think it was only until we played somebody like Fortuna Sitter that we started getting a bonus. Uh, it was anything over 30,000. I'm not too sure how much it was, but uh, we were checking the crowd every time we played. And with the Jim Green with the secretary, we were calling, have you, have you docked the crowd? <laughs> You know, because there seemed a lot more in that night, you know. Uh, we've got our most successful captain with us, ladies and gentlemen. There must be loads of questions. We've got time for about 10 questions or so. Yep. Harry, that 85 Cup final against Man United, anything a week later would we have won it? Um, I, mean, I thought we were doing all right until uh, Kevin Moran got sent off. Um, just seemed to throw everything. And Frank Stapleton had a great sort of, uh, you know, great game at centre-half. It's a bit different when you're playing against two strikers and then just playing against one. Um, and it, it just throws you a little bit. But uh, you know, I listen to stories now about Sharpie and Andy Gray looking at each other and saying, do your legs feel as bad as mine? I felt great on the day. You know, I didn't feel anything. I just felt that... Um, I must admit, on the day, I actually thought when, the, when they're sending off, the atmosphere in the ground turned to hatred by the United fans. And that's the only worry that I had, that I had... Um, Family in the in the ground, my nan and granddad, and you do start worrying about things like that. Um, but I felt great on the day. Most probably have a week, but uh, you know the last game of the season, isn't it? The FA Cup. It's the same this year, which is a great thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't think about that then, though. No, no, no such thing as recovery time recovery in those days, was there? No, no. Okay, next question. Yep. Well, I think the game is. Um, I don't know. It's uh, it seems to be going in the right direction. Um, you know, first season got an opportunity of being in the top five. That, that's not bad for me, um, you know. There's, and if you think that I've said this for about the last month or two, there's the only thing that's changed is the mid midfield and the striker. You know, the rest of the team has been there. Um, and it, it just seems this little bit of freedom that Roberto gives to the midfield players. I think Barry's an exceptional player, and hopefully we can sign him for next year. McCarthy seems to be be getting better, and obviously when Barry sort of um, Retires, hangs up his boots, which obviously, you know, could be in a few years' time. Then McCarthy, you know, looks like a ready replacement in that position. I don't think he's an attacking midfield player. Um, but when you've got people like Ross Barkley, sort of the emergence of him, giving them the freedom. And I think, you know, not scared to lose the ball. You know, the three in midfield is, uh, you know, the, been the big difference for me. We've always had two fullbacks bombing on, haven't we? I mean, Seamus, obviously, he's been getting goals this year, so... He's been highlighted. But Bainesy, you know, has maybe not scored as many as we'd expect him to this year. But, uh, 
you know, they, they both gallivant down that them them flanks, don't they? And the, they sort of link up well with whoever's playing wide, left or right. Um, the big difference for me is the midfield. But uh, you could say, I, I think, I think we you've got to be careful, you know, because you know you don't want to get into the mould that you're getting somebody sent off every week because you know it doesn't matter who you're playing against, then you're up against it. So it, it, the game's changed, you know. I agree sometimes that you need to have a little bit of muscle in there, but I think Gareth and you know, look at Distan, he's no sort of chicken, is he? You wouldn't want to be hitting him at uh, five mile an hour, never mind. <laughs> I think it's a it's a fair, but I think you could probably say that about a lot of teams, couldn't you? There just aren't as many odd cases about, are there anymore? I don't think there is any in, in the game, you know. And then when you when you see who's sort of noted as a hard man, you laugh, you know. You, you do have a little giggle to yourself that that's not really being hard. It's just, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit di it's a lot different the game now. Okay. Yep. Um, that a Yorkshire accent? Yeah. Not his, you're not his dad, are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm not too sure if he's a centre back or a or a full back yet. Um, after the disaster against Liverpool, and then to play him on the Saturday at right back, I think was a little bit harsh. Um, just wondered how much it might have damaged him, um, because every time he received the ball, didn't really want the ball. Time he received it, the ball was on the inside, on his inside, not on the outside. So the pass has gone, um, and I just worried about, it. oh, have we just lost this lad for the season now. But Saturday, I thought, yeah, he showed that he's, uh, you know, he's got it. He, what Roberto likes, centre half that can sort of be cool under pressure. Um, do have a few kittens now and again because I think there's a mistake in him. Um, a bit like Alcaraz, really. I think there's a mistake in him. I want to see Jags and, and Distan, you don't see too many mistakes in them too. And that's what it's about being the centre half that, you know, when when there's a goal, it's not you that's, you know, the mistake. Um, so hopefully, I mean, he's only, what is he, 20, 21. I'm, I'm very good friends with Dave Flickroft who actually sold him and he, he high, you know, highly recommended him. Um, he, he thinks he can be a, a right wing back if you want to go to three centre backs as well. So... Um, you know, Dave thinks that very, very highly with him. Think he'll go all the way. He played the right side of defence when we were in the states in the summer, and he, and he looked. He did look exceptional when we had three at the back. Uh, somebody else had their hand up. Yep. We can't really comment on that. We'll have a word with you when the uh, when the cameras are off. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got another question in the next five seconds. You, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? The, the quality of the Welsh side when you played was... Was it a case that you had, with all due respect, five world-class players and six... Uh, well... Others. It was... Uh, it was, it was you know... Difficult because, um, you know, you, you had myself, you had Neville, um, Rushy, Sparky, Dean Saunders. Um, we had too many too many players in the same position, really. With the, we had to name three strikers there. And that's why Sparky really dropped into midfield to play for Wales. Um, but then when you start looking on the fringes, then you might start looking at first division, second division. And then if they're playing and you have to change it, what you're looking to bring on. And we were bringing on people from Port Vale. A Wrexham, Swansea and Cardiff, who were then, you know, were playing in the in, in the lowest division, the third or fourth division. Um, and when, when I broke into the well side, I was 20, 21, 22, become captain just after I'd become captain for, for Everton at 23. I'd won FA Cup League by the time I was 24. I got about... 25 caps under my belt or something. Rushy had won a European Cup, FA Cup and the league. Uh, Sparky, I think, had won a... And, a and, and we were still only, like, 24. And then Sparky was only 23. Um, Neville, 25, but he, he hadn't played many games. And the rest of the team, the older members, the Joey Joneses, the Alan Curtises, the Robbie James, who were playing for lower league clubs, were actually looking for us, looking at us, to actually see what we're going to be doing. And 
we hadn't had any experience. We were just thrown in at the deep end. Um, and unfortunately, we never really had time to sort of have the Terry Yorut along around for too long. Um, I didn't anyway. And that's when I think it's very, very important at the international level that you've got a bit of experience there for the older lads, just to sit with them, tell them what it's all about. Because it's a completely different game. Um, and you'll, you'll see it in the World Cup this year, but if England don't keep the ball, and especially in them temperatures, they're going nowhere. You know, they'll be back on the on the first plane back. Um, it's very, very difficult. Different game to completely. How on earth did Pat Van Den Howe end up playing for Wales? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got a clue. <laughs> um, His first visit to Wales was to represent the country in a football match, wasn't it? I think it was, yeah. Yeah, I think... Uh, I think it wasn't. I don't don't even think he'd been to Rill. Um, <laughs> it's you know. It's, I think I don't know. Did he play five times? Played about, played about five or six times, and uh, I don't know wrong in it really. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a I'm a great believer. If you're Welsh, you play for Wales. If you're English, you play for England. And um, I'm not one of these that if you you're born in sort of Nigeria and you've lived here for twenty years, you can go and play for any country you want. I just I'm not a great believer in that. Any more questions, young lady? Um, how, did you, uh, how did you get to become a captain? Oh, well, that's a good question because I looked around the room when I was given the captain's armband and wondered exactly the same. <laughs> um, the first time it happened to me, we were over in, uh, we we're up in Scotland and we we're playing Dundee United and uh, Mark had picked up an injury. And I looked around, there's Billy Wright, there's um, David Johnson, um, and other sort of older players. And they said, right, lead them out, rats. And I was like 22, I think, at the time. And I was like, well, what's wrong with these? Like, you know, what and it, it's a bit embarrassing in one way, when you're 22 and you've got 28, 29-year-olds in the, in the changing room. And I think Reedy was on the trip as well. Um, so it was, a, you know, and, and, and the same when I played for Wales. That that was the biggest shock for me. We were playing Scotland, and uh, I was captain of Everton, but uh, never in, when I, when you've got Joey Jones, sort of in the squad who'd played like fifty odd times, sixty times, uh, Brian Flynn, um, Mickey Thomas, um, Robbie James, you know, Di Davis as well, and you're thinking, you know, you've you've been chosen above them. That was a bit that was more daunting, believe it or not, than than the Everton one. Um, because obviously every you're training every day with the lads, so you get to know the characters of the lads. So, but when you're at international level, you just meet up. For me, that was the biggest surprise. Great question. It was, well wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, we've got time for one more gentleman at the back. Kevin, you spoke earlier about the altercation with Thomas Hutchison. How did it feel to be on the receiving end of the Billy Jones one at Um It was great when he was going off the pitch. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, the talking about another hard man. I didn't actually think it was a hard man, uh, Vinny. I think he chose the people that he actually wanted to kick. Um, two occasions after that, there was 50-50 balls, and two occasions he, he pulled out. Because um, tell me I was going to go high on him. <laughs> um, he was, uh, yeah, he was, he'd actually done Sharpie. You know, and I was a big mate with Sharpie, so, uh, you know, I thought, I thought, and then when I looked around me and then you see the likes of Alan Cork and John Fashnu and <laughs> I thought, I'd best go down here. <laughs> I'm not going to win this one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was uh, interesting. All that. We, we still have a, a little bit of a heated thing about it. I mean, he barely touched me, barely touched me. You talk about diving. I suppose that was one of the first dives, that, you know, in the 80s. Um, but uh, you know, he, he's, he's still annoyed with it now by the sounds of it because it was in the papers the other week that I'd actually said, I was having a chat with somebody and, and said that, you know, he, he barely touched me and he's ranting and raving and, you know, uh, telling him, uh, that, you know, come round to my house and you, you can park in uh, Quentin Tarantino's place if you want. And yeah, yeah, I don't know if I want to go round to his house. There's nothing there to see. There's not a medal, is there? Maybe an FA Cup one. Yeah, but they only beat the red shite, didn't they? <laughs> Sorry again, cut. <laughs> yeah. and, and bizarrely in house as well a few Welsh international caps which was just another strange one yeah and I nearly sent mine back 
yeah, no, I, I wasn't happy with that decision at all because the, I think a month before he was Irish. And when he realised he couldn't play for Ireland, he decided he wanted to play for Wales and found somebody in Rithin that was uh, belonged to him. Um, yeah, no, that's, nah, that's not right. It's not right. I thought Bobby Gold, I'm still not sure to this day that uh, I know Vinnie Jones, if he was playing, well, I don't know which club he was at, but apparently he was on a good appearance money from his football club if he got an international cup cap. Uh, and that was every time he played. So I don't know if Bobby was getting a little bit of a backhander off off uh, Vinny for that. But it wouldn't surprise me. These views are the views of Kevin Ratcliffe and not those of yeah. Everton Football Club. <laughs> um. <laughs> see it in court. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what can you see if you've got nothing? You can't get anything, can you? Uh, we could go on and on all night, I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to stay in your seats, Rats will be round and he'll get some photographs taken. A legend. Kevin Ratcliffe.